welcome into Surviving Paradise, the podcast that takes a sometimes serious, oftentimes humorous look at the claim by Jehovah's Witnesses that they are living in a modern day spiritual paradise. I'm your host, Stacey Bauman, former elder, ministerial servant, and a kid raised as a Jehovah's Witness in the unique generations of the 70s and 80s. As I do, just a warning, there can be some triggering stuff here. We're trying to heal sarcasm, humor, and even the serious tears. They're all just my own brand of experience and observation, never meant to offend. want to thank anyone brave enough to be here and for taking the time. I have to admit that I find myself in a bit of a rut. The council coming out of upstate New York to Jehovah's Witnesses is some of the creepiest stuff I've ever seen out of them. From my limited vantage point, there seems to be, I don't know, a new vibe around the organization. I've shared my thoughts on all of the recent changes, the beards, the slacks, the time slips, four new kings, even the lowered ages for Bethel service, and of course, the fact that now you can have a last second conversion during the Great Tribulation, which makes the entire religion a moot point. But never mind. There are so many things to consider. But with those changes, the governing body realizes that there still may be a few sheep out there in the fold that seem to be asking a few too many questions. And they seem to be working hard to get out front of those whose minds are having split-second moments of clarity. <laughs> Their talks, the videos, the dramas, they all seem to highlight subtle, not-so-subtle counsel that tightens their control on an estimated 8 million-plus future paradise dwellers. I'm always willing to be wrong, but i got to ask here, have you noticed the same thing? Have you noticed the new vibe? In recent months, their videos have featured governing body helpers trying to wrangle up those sheep who have allowed their own thoughts and their potential obedience to stray a little bit. Last week, we discussed Brother Smith's recent video discouraging Jehovah's Witnesses from looking at the past, from considering their own memories, to abolish any thought of nostalgia or reminiscing. It's just not good for you. And I got to say, my creepy meter went off. And just when I'm leaning back into laughter, I then watched the next video on the only website powered by Holy Spirit. And I got to say, wow, have these guys just given up on anything that resembles education or a scholar? Are those days gone for good? They simply don't have the far-out minds to do it anymore. There's just not a lot of real deep thinkers or even weirdos. The Fred Franz types are all gone, and according to them, he's up there watching on from heaven now. And despite his, that being Freddie Kingly role, sitting next to Jesus right up there, they're rubbing elbows, Fred Franz no longer feels the need to do slave to teach anything that even looks a little deep. But tacit obedience to the 11 guys in upstate New York seems to be woven into every talk and video. We haven't even seen a new book on Revelation since 1988, despite the fact that they say the entire book is about mm, 2024. <laughs> 36 years of nothing new from the heavens regarding a Bible book that they tell us is all about today. Seems weird. We simply don't get that sort of stuff from the faithful slave anymore. Don't question what they're feeding us. Instead, with each talk and video, again, just my observation, Jehovah's Witnesses are being fed counsel on how to feel how to open and this week a pet subject of mine personally how to think. do you notice a trend as of late or is it just me governing body helper ralph walls 
You may remember him in the now famously leaked Bethel instruction videos for new recruits. It was Brother Walls that got the nod from the governing body to speak directly to the sisters, grown women, about how they dress, that short skirts turn men on. They do. And even some sisters, as he says in the video. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. He counseled grown women on masturbation. Not kidding. But his best line in that talk was when he said, quote, It is interesting to note that the male animal has no season in which he is not willing to engage in the breeding act. End quote. <laughs> In layman's terms, Brother Walls, guys like to get it on with attractive women. Got it. Thank you. You simply can't make this stuff up. And in the moment, Brother Ralph Walls entered the Jehovah's Witness Hall of Fame. If you've missed those talks from a few years ago, they were leaked. Please go look them up on YouTube with other content creators. But have you missed Brother Walls? Well, I have news for you. He's back. If you thought his most famous talk about those Bethel folks was creepy, and I got to tell you, I'm sure the women did. I'm really sure the sisters did. Consider what he is saying now. Currently featured under the videos tab on Jesus' website. His talk is called Protect Your Thinking Ability based on 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, of course, of the New World Translation, which says this, quote, For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but powerful by God, for overturning strongly entrenched things. For we are overturning reasonings and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are bringing every thought into captivity to make it obedient to the Christ. And we are prepared to inflict punishment for every disobedience as soon as your own obedience is complete. End quote. Interesting scripture. Bring your thoughts into captivity, not to the governing body, at least not in the Bible. It says to Jesus. And if you don't, he and the guys he has chosen are prepared to inflict punishment for disobeying him. Keep it in mind as we work our way through this talk. In what I think is the perfect complement to Brother Smith's talk that we considered last week on memories, we are about to get some counsel on something that may be more personal than short skirts or how we touch our own bodies. <laughs> Brother Walls is coming uh, for something deeply personal, something invisible, and virtually unknown to any other human being. Brother Walls and the 11 guys he answers to in New York are coming for our very thoughts. Anyone who is free from this organization should feel your body kind of stiffen up right now. <laughs> Maybe your butt puckers. Mine does. <laughs> he, we, I should say, used to sit in kingdom halls listening to this stuff, not giving it a second thought. In fact, if you were like me, we were usually daydreaming or just trying to stay awake at the meetings. But this was the messaging. Make no mistake, this messaging was landing somewhere in our brains. There has been a great deal of research done on the subconscious mind, and that also applies to Jehovah's Witnesses who are exposed to this kind of conditioning in kingdom halls week after week, oftentimes for many of them from birth. A Jehovah's Witness is often reminded that even their thoughts, their own thoughts, are not private. And as we will see from this talk, they need to be controlled like everything else in the life of a Jehovah's Witness. 
one of many examples from the Watchtower of 1986, the March 15th issue, pages 21 through 23 features, how can we be fully pleasing to Jehovah? It tells us, quote, what about our thoughts? God tells us that there is not a creation that is not manifest to his sight, but all things are naked and openly exposed to the eyes of him with whom we have an accounting. Neither humans nor demons can read our thoughts, but God can. That being so, we want our very thoughts to be pleasing to him. End quote. And so, if you think there is anywhere you can hide from Jehovah, think again. And as you think that thought, he knows you're thinking that thought. Isn't that comforting? He saw you look at that cute sister, and he knows what you're thinking. He's even inside your head. It's very comforting, wouldn't you agree? <laughs> sure, it begs the question, is there anything else he could be doing? I don't know, like saving lives, or maybe building a new museum in Wallkill where Jehovah's Witnesses can tour Noah's Ark? Maybe he should do that. <laughs> There's Noah. No, he would never do that. He would never do that. Because too many people would realize their make-believe box couldn't carry the animal kingdom. And some smart-ass kid like me would ask how Noah dodged making babies with Mrs. Noah for 500 years. I could see it now. Hey, fake bearded guy at the fake ark, did Noah have condoms? <laughs> that would have been me. I'm sorry. <laughs> But pay no attention to any of it, because instead, Jehovah spends his days and nights somewhere out there in the cosmos. He visits the inside of your head. And Brother Walls is about to remind us of this very fact for the next 8 minutes and 49 seconds of video. And, and wait a minute. Isn't that the exact same length of Brother Smith's no-no talk about memories from last week? Yeah, it is. Eight minutes and 49 seconds. Is this some sort of modern-day prophecy? <laughs> Are we counting the minute? Aside from both brothers getting a passing grade on timing when giving their talks from the theocratic overseer, I couldn't help but wonder as I watch this, because this is how my weird brain is, if this is a lot like Charles Taze Russell you know, leaning into his pyramid measurements to give us the time of the end. Remember those things? Gotta do it. I will try not to go off the rails. From Study in the Scriptures, Thy Kingdom Come, Series 3, page 342. You remember Chuck. Thanks for listening in up there. Quote, Then measuring down the entrance passage from that point to find the distance to the entrance of the pit, representing the great trouble and destruction... <laughs> destruction with which this age is so close when evil will be overthrown from power we find it to be 3416 inches symbolizing 3416 years from the above date bc 1542 this calculation shows A.D. 1874 as marking the beginning of the period of trouble. For 1,542 years B.C. plus 1,874 years A.D. equals 3,416. Thus, the pyramid witnesses that the close of 1874 was the chronological beginning of the time of trouble, end quote. <laughs> wow. These videos are 8 minutes and 49 seconds, and it immediately brought me back to this stuff. Look, Chuck just wasn't reading his ruler right, so don't hold it against him. Jehovah gave him a message to bust out that ruler and go to Egypt and measure the Great Pyramid. And that pyramid and his ruler would give him all the answers as to when the end was coming. When I first was exposed to this, I thought, man, 
how pissed Moses is going to be when he's resurrected and finds out that it all led back to Egypt anyway. <laughs> Wait a minute, you made me get him, leave, wander around, but what, what, it was all in Egypt all along? Never mind. As usual, I digress. Back to Brother Wall's talk. I'm sorry for the, the brain fart. <laughs> Brother Wall's talk of 8 minutes and 49 seconds, talking on capturing our thoughts. He begins with the following. As usual, please don't take my word for any of this. Go watch this if you're interested. It's right there for the world to watch on the website. Take no one's word for any of this. But it was interesting. As I watch Brother Wall's, he has a very ominous like serious tone throughout the talk. And I got to tell you, he starts it with a bang. He says, quote, the fact is we are at war. There is an intense battle to control our minds, end quote. The irony of this entire talk begins with the first sentence in what is either a stunning lack of self-awareness or more likely a calculated message, the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses proceeds to spend the next eight minutes trying to capture um, our minds. Our minds. The same minds he's telling us are at war and people are trying to capture them. They then try to capture them. He goes on to continue by listing all the enemies of our thoughts. He says, quote, We have the spirit of the world which surrounds us and can affect our thinking. They have demon-inspired teachings at their base. And then we deal with our own imperfect inclination. And on top of that, each of us has a traitor within him. All of us do which is our heart, which the Bible describes as more treacherous than anything else, end quote. We are clearly up against it, folks. We're up against it. I'll come back to the spirit of the world and the demons and their messages, but this comment about our hearts that he makes, he calls our hearts a traitor. And I'm guessing Brother Wall's got this, eh, not so much, at least the verbiage from the Bible, but I got a feeling he got this from his own Watchtower library. The Watchtower of 1971, March 1st, page 139, paragraph 2. The human heart is treacherous, is the article. We were told this in 71. Quote, a person who is treacherous is marked by a ready disposition to betray confidence or faith pledged. He is disloyal, untrustworthy, really traitorous. Think of it. We all have in our imperfect state a potential traitor enclosed in our bosom. <laughs> is it not true that at times we are appalled? Yes, ashamed over things that start to take root in the heart? And when the heart wants something desperately, this can lead to serious trouble. It is vital that we make adjustments quickly to quiet down those new affections, to eliminate those sudden desires. End quote. Thank you, Watchtower of 71, and thank you for the reminder in 2024 Brother Ralph Walls, our very hearts in our bodies is a traitor. My self-esteem and personal trust in my own judgment, well, after this reminder, is at an all-time high. <laughs> I saw Jesus do this a lot to people in the Bible, kind of break them down by telling them they're a hot mess. The leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses has created an environment of self-doubt that can only be relieved by relying on a third party when making any decision. Who's that third party, you ask? Them. Them. 
And with that, this talk is off to a strong start. Just knowing that your heart and all that you've fed it throughout your life may in fact be deceiving you, it's a traitor, and no, I'm not referring to talking to yourself into an extra piece of cake or another drink that you shouldn't have, but in any major decision you make about yourself, your life, or your future, it's betraying you and requires you to second guess yourself and go to them for guidance and answers. I've always felt as though the Bible itself presents problems in this regard. It's very mixed messaging. That's my opinion. I'm willing to be wrong. I can certainly pull up verses speaking to our self-worth and how we're made in God's image and we're amazing. And I can even see that Jesus decided to come down, crawl into the belly of a virgin, be born, and live a human life and lay down his life for my own imperfect ass as proof we should have a balanced view of what seems to be our inestimable worth. But I can find just as many verses in the Bible pointing to what a flawed, hot mess I am. <laughs> guess which one this talk is going to lean into? I'll give you one guess. <laughs> With just a little bit of effort. A Jehovah's Witness who is truly seeking the truth about this organization can access their Watchtower library and find the Watchtower articles that these very talks are lifted from some 40 to 50 years later. I have no doubt that whoever wrote this manuscript talk for Brother Walls lifted the thought about our hearts as traitors from this Watchtower article in 1971. Remember, they're feeding us food at the proper time. And well, I got to tell you, I don't know if you reach into your refrigerator and pull out something that's been in the back of it since 1971. Mmm, look at this. This looks good. It's been in the fridge for 50 years. But they do. And here we are. Food and reminders about our own thoughts and our hearts a traitor from 1971. And as is always the case, it, look, their tactics haven't changed much in 53 years. Hasn't changed. I can almost bet that this manuscript and this whole thought about our hearts being traitors comes from this article. And listen, I know I harp on this dynamic a lot on the show, but it's because I think it's really critical for anyone waking up to know this, to realize that this food that they claim to be feeding you in their spiritual paradise has been sitting in the refrigerator for 53 years. <laughs> They're just pulling it back out. Who likes leftovers? Ugh. Breaking free of their grip on a person's thought is the single greatest act toward a life of freedom. Please know that if you're new here. So is it any wonder that Brother Walls and his bosses start this talk by creating a sense of doubt in every single person listening or watching? It's really obvious once you're free from all of this, but truthfully, it's painful and uncomfortable until you've exercised their grip on your mind. And before we continue, one observation from the video. I mentioned that Ralph Walls seems to have a very serious or ominous tone throughout this talk. Did anybody else notice that? If you've seen this or you go watch it, I don't want to put any thoughts in your head, but I'd love to get an opinion. He seems very serious or ominous. His speech is very deliberate. It's really slow. I watched it several times to determine if I saw or I was seeing things that just weren't there because I'm biased. But in the end, I came to the conclusion that Brother Walls, he looks genuinely depressed to me. He looks like he is down in the dumps. I've seen him give several talks over the years, but he looks very different in this one. He looks drained. I'd love to get opinions on this. He was light years more animated and excited to discuss sister's legs and masturbation. He seemed pretty excited when he was giving that talk, at least for him. But now in this one about thoughts and thought control, he looks downright depressed to me. 
I can't help but wonder if he knows. Because based on his age, he's getting old. And he knows what comes next for him. He doesn't have a heavenly hope, to my knowledge. I don't believe he claims to be anointed. I think he's a helper, which means he gets a pair of khakis and a pet monkey soon. I don't know. But it stands out to me in this talk, and as someone who's fairly intuitive and, you know, for good or for worse, tends to read people in certain ways, he really looks bummed out to me. But Brother Walls continues with a talk that centers around thought control. And as mentioned at the outset, he likens it to a war. He next says, quote, Now when we consider the forces we are fighting against in this war, we could not possibly win this war on our own. But with help from Jehovah, we can't lose. End quote. So the governing body wants us to know that we are at war with ourselves, with Satan and the demons, with everything around us in the world. War. It's a theme with this organization. I've done episodes on it. An organization who spends each and every day looking forward to, ironically, uh, guess what? A war. A war where, by far and away, the majority of people who don't agree with them in New York on everything, they've said they themselves will actually destroy in a mass genocide. By the way, not by Jesus, but they get to take part in it. They get to take part in that. If you're a witness listening, remember these guys, these governing body guys, they, their future, what they're looking forward to is they get to kill all those people down here, the rest of us. There's no irony here to consider, but in this case, you could be future bird food based on, as this talk brings out, your thoughts. This is a war with all that it implies. Thanks for the reminder, Brother Walls. Have you ever seen, as I was listening to this and watching this, have you ever seen a 10-year-old boy fight a dyed-in-the-wool veteran, well-trained UFC adult male? You ever seen a 10-year-old fight a UFC fighter? How do you think that would turn out? What's it, what are you guessing would be the end result of a 10-year-old and a UFC fighter in a ring. Full disclosure, by the way, no offense to anyone that enjoys it, but I can't even watch those UFC fights. I do not like them. To be candid, as a guy who likes football, I find the UFC fights too violent, way too violent for me. But imagine that 10-year-old fighting the UFC champion and then realize and recognize, you see, that is what Jehovah is asking Jehovah's Witnesses to do every day. But, but, but he's in your corner. He's going to provide you water, and he's going to you know, provide a towel and give your, your back a rub in between rounds. These are his words, not mine. From the Watchtower of 1993, February 1st, page 6, Will Good Ever Conquer Evil is the article. We're told this, quote, Good conquers evil every time an evil thought is rejected. Every time we refuse to return evil for evil. Yet, such victories, important as they are, do not eliminate the two main sources of evil. However hard we try, we cannot entirely overcome our inherited weaknesses and Satan still exercises an evil influence over mankind. End quote. Gotta tell ya, this talk is doing wonders for my self-esteem. My heart's a mess. I'll never be able to get it under control. I've got to watch my thoughts. Jehovah's bouncing around in, in between my ears. This really seems like a fair fight when you consider that Satan is also apparently involved in how we think. This really seems fair, doesn't it? Especially considering the perfect man and woman couldn't even handle the first shot fired in this war by a talking snake. That same snake, incidentally created by Jehovah himself, now has access to Jehovah's Witnesses. And his weapons have moved beyond a tree that 
uh, this is awkward, Jehovah also created himself into all sorts of weapons that can influence a Jehovah's Witness thought. Ironic? Doing wonders for a witness listening? Is any witnesses listening putting these thoughts together? Probably not. So let's listen in on more of Brother Wall's counsel. He continues, quote, The enemy has been able to get some from among us, and these have become battle casualties. End quote. Well, we've already established it's certainly a fair fight. Thanks, Jehovah. It's a good fight. Good to know that those of us that just couldn't bring our thoughts into alignment with the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, well, those people are now just casualties. That's all he says about them. They're just goners. Try to step over them. <laughs> watch, watch where you step. They're dead. No mention of the fact that when bullets are flying and Satan was attacking these people, it was the organization itself that used these people, these casualties, as human shields and pushed them, literally pushed them out to the front lines of this theocratic war by, I don't know, shunning them and telling everyone within the congregation to treat them as a dead casualty. Nope. Brother Ralph Walls just doesn't mention that. He just wants us to know what a drag it is. They're just casualties. Isn't that sad? <laughs> Brother Walls, you, you made them casualties. Uh, in a fight that Jehovah created by a spirit he created, I, I could keep going. We've covered it all before. But apparently, Brother Walls and the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, when considering this war on our minds and war on everything else, they aren't familiar with the term friendly fire. They may have been assaulted by an elder, physically, don't want to go there. Or they may be someone just dealing with depression. Or they might be lonely as hell. Or they may be someone who knows, uh, just cognitively, that new generations don't overlap. It's never been heard of before. Or they could see at Psalms 146 verse 3 blatantly that it commands Jehovah's Witnesses to not follow men. Never follow men. But now? Well, those same people, folks, they're just a casualty. They're just a casualty. I'm a casualty. I'll say it here. For some reason, that whole comment by Jesus about leaving the 99 sheep to find the one that was lost, well, it doesn't apply here, folks. Brother Walls doesn't mention that. He just mentions that some people have been casualties without ever saying, well, we kind of made them casualties. <laughs> this is war. And by the way, when they do leave, if we don't push them out ourselves, well, eh, we don't go looking for them. We don't help them. They're just a casualty. Let's move along. <laughs> Brother Walls, how can we survive this awful war you're telling us about? This war on our minds. He continues, quote, But as long as we keep on the complete suit of armor, described in the Bible at Ephesians chapter 6, we will avoid being a casualty. Oh, we got armor. Okay, back to the quote. There is no secret formula. It's right there in the scriptures. And there is one particular part of the armor that we want to center on, the helmet of salvation. Now, why does the Bible use the term helmet of salvation? Well, just as a soldier, in protecting his head where his brain was, which drives all of the senses, so the helmet of salvation protects our minds. He continues, quote, The March 2021 Watchtower, page 29, says this, Jehovah will protect you. How? Well, just as a literal helmet protects a soldier's head, the hope of salvation protects our thinking ability and keeps us focused on God's promises and helps us to see problems in the right perspective. End quote. Nothing new here. Nothing new. We're all likely familiar with this. This stuff about armor 
in the helmet of salvation. It's the stuff district assembly symposiums used to be made of. Breaking it down, armor piece by armor piece. Take a set of Bible verses and dissect them verse by verse and apply them to a modern day Jehovah's Witness. A full suit of armor is just too much fun for the guys. The faithful slave, they can build an entire convention around this stuff, and they have in the past. He wants us to put on our helmet of salvation to protect our brains. Doesn't give a lot of explanation on what the helmet of salvation is. He just says to focus on God's promises, the same promises these guys have been rolling out to humanity since the late 1800s. Where might this talk be going? Where are we going here, Brother Walls? We've got this thought that we're train wrecks, that we need to control our thoughts, that Jehovah's looking at them. Apparently Satan's involved. It's a war. Put on your helmets, folks. Put on your helmets. Where is this talk going? We've heard this stuff before. Well, wait no longer, my friends. He next says this, quote, But think about this. Thinking ability is not to be confused with independent thinking, which Satan promotes, end quote. Oh, yeah. Of course not, Ralph. We would never, as a Jehovah's Witness, want to think for ourselves, right? Our very thoughts don't belong to us. But maybe you can answer one question for us potential casualties who have used our brains. I know it's sinful, but we did it. How does this work with things like, uh, I don't know, as I'm listening to this talk, we want to be thinkers, but we don't want to be independent thinkers. I, listen, I got a question. How does this work with things like uh, free will? How does this line of thinking work with free will? It's my understanding from you guys in upstate New York and the Bible and all sorts of other sources within this org that I have free will but you're here telling me I can't think independently. Am I truly free? Is free will a thing? How does this all work exactly, Ralph? I'm so confused at this point. It was my understanding that uh, your bosses have taught this, I don't know, this free will thing for the better part of three centuries, that the entire war, this very war this talk is about, is all based on the concept of, of free will. Do you know, we size up a matter as a witness and we make a personal decision, but, but you're here telling us we should never tap into independent thinking? What? Huh? How does this work, Brother Walls? Does that not make the entire issue of universal sovereignty completely baseless if I can't independently think? If I can't think for myself, because that's what Satan does, and Jehovah wants us all to think like Jehovah does, why didn't he have Adam kill Satan in the beginning? Make some snakeskin boots, and we could all just be thinking like Jehovah in 2024, because we don't want independent thinking as free will or free will agents. We could just be walking around in the nude and coming up with ways to deal with the chafing we got from riding our pet elephants all day. Why aren't we doing that? There's no thought that goes into these talks. Free will and independent thinking, uh, they're kind of the same thing, folks. But we shouldn't be doing it, making the entire issue of universal sovereignty and free will completely useless. All joking aside, this organization doesn't seem to comprehend that thought control, erasing or controlling people's thoughts, memories, nostalgia, and all the rest of it they, they seem to be harping on, makes the entire war between Jehovah and Satan a moot point. 
They don't seem to understand this. Do they not yet understand Satan's challenge? The one they themselves taught the rest of us? Because they're more blessed and smarter than we are. <laughs> Jehovah wants us all to think like him and the governing body. You see, this apparently is the new definition of free will. No independent thinking. No, 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 no. Think like us. <laughs> is this new light? Is this new light? Somebody... <laughs> Has anyone got confirmation? You see, independent thinking is at the core of the entire human experience. People have to think independently. We teach our kids to think independently. I'm pretty sure the book Jehovah allegedly gave us is one giant textbook on, um independent thinking. There's no record of how Noah knew where to find a silverback gorilla, but apparently he figured it out. How'd he do that? He thought independently. He was a problem solver. In fact, it's Noah and his independent thinking that had him plant a vineyard post-worldwide flood and now it's Noah who is the first person on record that got hammered drunk. We know what getting drunk's about. Thanks, Noah. No record of Jehovah telling him to do those things. He came up with them on his own. Right? Problem solving. Independent thinking. Choices. All part of the human experience. But what do I know? Moses also never felt the need to record the names of Noah's family in terms of the ladies of the family, the women. That's a theme. Who knows? I could keep going. But what is a Jehovah's Witness going to do about all of this independent thinking that is seemingly infiltrating the organization and people's brains in 2024? What does Brother Walls mean when he says independent thinking? Because we don't want to be a casualty in this war. I don't think anyone signs up for that. Well, let's allow him to define it for us as he speaks for the governing body of this organization. He continues in this talk, quote, One indication of independent thinking is to question the counsel we receive from the visible part of Jehovah's organization and the faithful slave, end quote. And there it is. I'm sure we all knew it was coming. They're very forthright with the purpose of this entire talk. You and I must agree with the thinking of other uh, flesh and blood men in upstate New York, don't you question them. If you question what they're telling us, you are an independent thinker and you will soon be a casualty in this war. If you too don't believe that innocent babies, those precious little munchkins, are enemies of God like Stephen Lett does, or, or if you don't believe that women's brains are 10% smaller than men's so they aren't equipped to lead anything like Samuel Hurd does, or, or you're not looking forward to people being split open like hot dogs like Toni Morris said, or you know the hair growing on your chin your entire life was never a big deal to begin with, or you can see that these guys have a 100% failure rate on predicting the end of the world, or, 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 and I could keep going. If you don't agree with them and you're doing this independent thinking, if you don't think like these men, you are an independent thinker and you will be a casualty in a interstellar war between a couple of invisible spirits, one of whom created the other. And we can't have that, now can we? You must, I must, listen to the 11 men 
in upstate New York, including the two new guys who just two weeks ago, it didn't matter what they told us or said to us because they weren't kings yet, but now they are. Now they are. We must listen to them. Stop your independent thinking. It's the purpose of this entire talk. We saw it coming from the outset. We all do. Brother Walls goes on by saying that God's organization has warned us about things like music, pornography, and frequenting clubs and dance halls. Is that, is that still an issue? I don't know. As well as getting drunk. And of course, I immediately thought of Noah. I wonder who counseled Noah. God, he was an independent thinker. Wild. He says we know some think they can skirt around such things and says there are many more things that you can't. <laughs> but then Brother Walls gets into the message they really wanted to land with this talk. He says, quote, But unfortunately, there is independent thinking that at times come from our very fellow worshipers. End quote. Dun, dun, dun. Uh-oh. How dare a Jehovah's Witness think for themselves? It looks like we have some war casualties or dead men walking inside the organization. It looks like they're doing too much thinking. How could that be? I don't know. It's their claim that this is a spiritual paradise. Are there Pimos walking around in the organization? Yes, there are. Are they hiding behind that beard? Have they figured out how to game the system? I hope they're not looking at this organization's past and realizing that they have a 100% failure rate and they used to measure pyramids. They used to sell miracle wheat in their magazine and, and dove into all the great medical advice, including how to kill ourselves instead of getting a tonsillectomy. I hope they're not doing those things. <laughs> how dare they think independently? But don't get excited. Brother Walls continues, and he has an example of independent thinking he is going to share with us so that we know we can define what it means to think for yourself, which is a big no-no. He continues, quote, for example, have you ever heard someone say, you're still just a housewife? I'm sorry. <laughs> Times have changed. Why don't you go get a job? Or the expression, pioneering is not for everyone. You need more training and education if you're going to make it in today's world. Let them tap your talents and skills. I feel the best way to help my disfellowship relative is to stay in touch with them. But you know what? Thinking ability is what protects us from these other reasonings that don't reflect Jehovah's thinking on matters. And since God created us in his image, it's only logical and realistic that we can have thinking ability only if we adopt God's way of thinking. End quote. And with this section of the talk, he opened a Pandora's box between my ears that I couldn't close. There it is, folks. If you're a woman listening in, how dare you want to be anything other than a housewife? How dare you, you independent thinker? By the way, I just want to say that's an incredibly honorable job, a very hard job. But if, if you would like to do anything else with your life and all your skills, how dare you? You are on the fast track to being bird food at Armageddon, you independent thinker. Apparently, there are some sisters struggling with the idea of spending their lives handing out literature at a book cart all day. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? It truly is the height of intellectual nirvana, after all, to stand next to a book cart and smile at people. Or maybe you're someone who is being told to shun your own flesh and blood, as Brother Walls brings out here, and can see that it's absolutely insane. Well, you too are guilty of independent thinking, according to this guy. You're like Satan himself, and you've clearly taken off your helmet. Put it back on. 
You see, you can best help everyone and anyone, no matter their situation or emotional state or physical state. You see, you can best help them by shunning them, according to these guys. It works every time. It does wonders. Never mind what the medical community says. Looks like there might be a few independent thinkers out there. And they're in the organization. And these guys, by means of this stock, want to stomp that out immediately. Free will and the concept of free will be damned. You are not to think for yourself. I personally, during this talk, really feel like this was directed at the sisters. A woman who doesn't want to stand in front of a book cart for life and a mother who wants to love her disfellowship child, they were targeting them. He says it. He uses both of those things as examples. He was targeting the women. But they can't have that. They still want even the ladies to put their brains in the mason jar at the door of the kingdom hall. Take them out. No thinking here. No thinking allowed. Think our way. But let's focus for a minute. And this is the Pandora box that opened that I couldn't get shut. I'm sorry. Thanks for being here for the next few minutes. Let's focus for a minute on his wise counsel about being created in Jehovah's image and thinking like Jehovah. We, we have the mind of Jehovah. We have the mind of Christ. We, we must think in Jehovah's image and that we need to reflect Jehovah's thinking. The way Jehovah thinks on all matters of our lives. Please buckle your seatbelts if you haven't fallen out of the chariot already. I'm about to go off road for a minute. Where can we find Jehovah's thinking on any and all matters of life? I can hear you out there. Well, Stacy, that's easy. The Bible. The Bible tells us how Jehovah thinks about everything. Ah, you're right. Yes, of course. The Bible. The Bible's the answer. If I need to get Jehovah's thinking, I don't want to abolish my own thoughts. I need to get his thinking. So let's dig in. I'm really trying to bring my thoughts into captivity, as the Bible says, and align every decision, every goal, every action in my life with how Jehovah thinks, according to Brother Walls and the Eleven in New York. And we are very fortunate to have an instruction manual that shows us exactly how Jehovah thinks. So here we go. Hope you're sitting down. I have a lot of decisions to make in my life as a Jehovah's Witness in 2024. And I want to think like Jehovah does. Don't want to be independently thinking. Don't want to be a casualty. Let's get his viewpoint on a few things. Huh, here's one. I invite my new neighbor for a welcome dinner over to the house, and the rest of the neighborhood, oh my God, they surround my house. They're banging on the door as we try to eat. Not because they weren't invited to my barbecue, but, well, because they want to have sex with our new neighbor. Wait a minute, what's going on here? It's 2024. That's right, the neighborhood's pounding on the door. They saw the new neighbor come in. They know we're doing things in here, and they want to have sex with the new neighbor. This is shocking. Wait a minute, I know what I'll do. I know how Jehovah thinks about this type of thing. I'll open the door, and I'll offer them my two daughters. They can have my two daughters instead for a gang assault out in the driveway. Does that sound like a good idea? I have Jehovah's thinking on matters. He made sure I knew how he thought about such things. You're not getting a neighbor. You're getting my baby girls instead. That's right. Jehovah made sure I was prepped for this event in 2024 by sharing the story of Lot in the Bible. Man, I was worried for a minute. Thank God I didn't think independently right there. How about this? I was looking out my window. Oh, man, look at that. Cue the music. I was looking out the window at my neighbor's wife. She's next door in the hot tub in the backyard. Damn, she's fine. I want her. I'm going to send her husband to the store. 
but I'm going to slash one of his tires so he gets in a wreck on the way to the store, and then I'll have her all to myself, his wife. It's not the best decision, but it's not a big deal. When she gets pregnant, Jehovah will just kill the baby as punishment. Not me or her. He'll kill the baby. The husband's dead. The baby's dead. And I'll continue on as the head of the HOA here in the neighborhood. Thanks for giving me your thoughts, Jehovah. Those thoughts I got from David and Bathsheba. As a witness in 2024, I'm going to apply this. Thank you for getting, helping me get rid of my independent thinking. How about this? I recently bought a home. Even though Armageddon is going to wipe it out any second, forget about that. And my realtor, would you look at my realtor kept some of my closing costs for a personal bonus. I sure hope Jehovah kills him and lets me watch. Thank you, Jehovah, for recording your thoughts on Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament. You see, I'm getting Jehovah's thinking on matters. I'm abolishing my independent thinking and common sense. But how about this? I got to tell you, this one's really adjusted my thinking. As a parent of multiple kids, I've been letting the neighborhood bully kick the shit out of all of my kids since they were little, since they could walk. How do I rig this situation in my favor? You see, I believe in free will, but I, eh, how about this? I think I'll plant a bad guy in my favorite son's friend group. He's got 12 friends after all. Let's make one of them bad. He will then betray my favorite son. He'll get my favorite son killed. And with that, I can redeem all of my kids from the neighborhood bully, uh, who is also oddly one of my kids, the bully himself. <laughs> Thank you, Jehovah, for giving me your thinking on Jesus' ransom and stuff. You see how this works, folks? You see how it works? No independent thinking. None of that. Get Jehovah's thinking. And if you want Jehovah's thinking, it's in his instruction manual known as the Bible. All four or five of those examples came right from the pages of instruction manual. Thank you, Governing Body and Brother Ralph Walls. We certainly have a lot to consider when bringing our thinking into line with Jehovah's because we are made in his image after all and he gave us a blueprint on how to think like he does. But truthfully, I feel terrible and I'm clearly a casualty of this war that he speaks of and I don't have a helmet, can't find it because I wouldn't do any of those things any of those things I just mentioned from his own book, so I'm clearly not thinking like Jehovah thinks, nor his 11 guys in upstate New York. But if you think this is all bad, this talk is about to get worse. <laughs> Brother Walls then takes the audience to read Proverbs 1, verse 7, which says, quote, the fear of Jehovah is the beginning of knowledge. Only fools despise wisdom and discipline, end quote. Please go watch it. He goes out of his way to emphasize the word fools. We are fools. But he continues by saying, quote, By and large, most people respond favorably to Jehovah's way of thinking. I gave you a few examples. That is why we are part of a beautiful organization that is at peace with itself and knows how to navigate the problems of this world. End quote. Wait, Ralph, I guess I'm a fool. I guess I'm a fool. And anyone who doesn't agree with what you're doing or what Jehovah's done as fools. What? The insanity in this comment at this point point in the talk. Any human being on this earth can Google two words, Jehovah's Witnesses, at this very hour and see that this organization is far from, as you say, quote, at peace. And if you're at peace with yourself, sitting on the knowledge of children being grotesquely harmed inside your walls, 
then you're one sick fu- Never mind. Never mind. Navigating problems, as you say? How so? You claim that you're at peace and that this organization helps us to not independently think and to, quote, navigate the problems of this world. How so? I have a rare blood disease. I need blood to keep living. Any thoughts? What should I do? I can't survive on the minimum wage that I'm currently living on. Can I go get some education and get a better job? No. What is Jehovah's thinking? Because I can't find it anywhere in the Bible. But I'm sure you have an opinion, right, Brother Walls? Never mind. I'm just a housewife. (laughs) I'm just a housewife after all. But he continues in the talk, quote, We are being trained by Jehovah to use our thinking ability individually, but not independently. Though depending on the circumstances, Bible principles allow for varying conclusions on the matter, end quote. And I immediately at this point wanted to raise my hand and ask him about everything the faithful slave has ever said about that thing called uh, your conscience. We've already obliterated free will. We're now obliterating the conscience. Or maybe they're low-key referring to, well, there can be varying conclusions, as he says but it still has to agree with us. Are we allowed to use our conscience? Or is that independent thinking? Is that independent of you fellows as well? Don't ask too many questions here. One of the problems with asking questions of these guys is you're engaging your brain, the one you were born with. And they consider that to be independent thinking. And well, that makes you, as he just told us, a fool. You're just a fool for using your brain. According to Brother Walls, the verse he used in the Bible, and the 11 guys who put him up in front of the camera. They're literally down to using the Bible for name calling at this point. That's what it is. And I couldn't help but remember Jesus' words at Matthew 5.22 when he called everybody fools. Uh, the English Standard Version of this verse in Matthew 5.22 says this, quote, But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. End quote. Uh Uh-oh, Brother Walls, you're not going to be a casualty, are you? (laughs) You just told us we're all fools if we don't agree with you and your bosses. Incidentally, that verse in Matthew 5.22 Fascinating to look back at how they've changed it in the New World Translation side point. And an additional side point, I guess, is that Jehovah himself with his own book can call people fools, but we can't, uh, but think like him. Round and round we go in the most flawed pool of logic you will ever encounter. But Brother Walls continues, he says, quote, But we undoubtedly make Jehovah's heart glad when we do what the Bible describes, written by Paul. If you turn there on your devices, end quote. I'm sorry, this is a side point, but man, have times changed. We don't need the Bible. We don't need a book anymore. He literally says in this talk, please access your devices. What? I still cannot believe this. I know that there's younger generations. This is all they've ever seen. But for you folks that are my age or or not that much younger, can you believe this? Entire generations of Jehovah's Witnesses don't know where to find anything in the Bible. They just whip out a tablet and they touch the screen with their fingertip. They don't know where to find anything. Is that wild to anybody else? Can anybody else wrap their heads around this? I can't believe it. Remember back in the day when we memorized the Bible books? Remember that? It's one of the first things us young kids would do, memorize the books of the Bible. And do you remember what it was like to hold the Bible in your hand when you were a witness or are and be able to find anything 
by swiping the pages, anything we wanted in God's instruction manual. It's not true anymore. Now Jehovah's Witnesses just need to swipe right. Swipe right. Push a button. Swipe right. It's uncanny to me. And it was something that stood out in this talk as how far removed as a casualty I am of this war. But he continues, that comment uh, about on your devices, he continues and invites them to read 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, which reads the following quote, for the weapon of our warfare are not fleshly, but powerful by God for overturning strongly entrenched things. For we are overturning reasonings and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are bringing every thought into captivity to make it obedient to the Christ, end quote. A verse I'm very familiar with, no doubt many here are. So what are those weapons we can use during this war, Brother uh, Walls? He continues, quote, isn't that interesting? And it's a beautiful thing to see among Jehovah's people in general. Godly thinking allows us to see the consequences before we take the action whether the consequences are going to be good or bad, end quote. Uh, huh? What? Full disclosure, I rewound this section eight times. I still have no idea what he's trying to say. Did that make any sense to you? Read 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. I, I kind of see what he's trying to get at. It's very poorly done. I was wondering what the weapons are that the verse refers to. And he just goes on a rant about people seeing consequences before they happen. Of course, you're not supposed to do that. He's already told us we couldn't independently think, which means looking to the future and coming to a conclusion. Don't do that. We'll tell you how this is going to end. We'll tell you. But I couldn't help personally. Does he mean like getting baptized in 1985 like I did? When, when I was told I would never grow old or die before the end of the 20th century? Eh, 21st. Gotta tell you, Brother Walls, neither I nor millions of other Jehovah's Witnesses saw that whole overlapping generation thing coming. So what exactly do you mean here when you say we can see how the consequences will turn out before we take the action? Incidentally, the irony is we need to think to do that. That's okay. No worries. What consequences and what weapons? Well, this one will shock no one, but he never explains it. Of course not. He's reading from a manuscript. However, he does do something next that is interesting, particularly in the light of last week's episode on looking into the past and how that's a big no-no. He does that whole one-trick pony thing again. He takes the entire audience back to the past and back to ancient Israel. Yeah, Brother Smith last week told us not to do this, but here we are doing it again. It's okay. <laughs> Don't think. <laughs> and as usual, his Bible verse and example make no sense. In fact, they only raise more questions, not the least of which is how the hell do you know what an average Israelite was thinking about back then? <laughs> how do you know, Brother Walls? How do you know? Did Jehovah tell you? Did he tell the government? About? How do you know? He says that the Israelites rejected Jehovah's guidance, and he reads Deuteronomy 32, verses 28 and 29, and says Moses was inspired to write these verses. He wants to make sure you know that. Jehovah told him to do this, and to write, quote, they're a nation devoid of sense. We might say common sense. Or as the footnote says, deaf to advice. If only they were wise, they would ponder over this. They would understand the outcome, end quote. Just going to say again, the most convoluted explanation of a couple of verses I've ever seen. Like, what is it? I know what he's trying to do based on experience, but it doesn't make any sense. And if you watch him do this on video, in context of this talk, it comes off as a threat. It really comes off as a threat. But isn't it rich that Brother Walls and his 11 overlords on the governing body want to tell the rest of us about common sense? You really want to tell us about common sense. You want to tell us what common sense looks like. 
the exact same guys that have now allowed grown men to dance in Kingdom Hall aisles about those same 11 guys giving those same grown men the permission to grow hair on certain parts of their bodies? Yes, please do tell me about common sense. I can't wait what you have to say, Brother Walls. Or the same guys who gave women the permission to wear pants when it's freezing cold outside, even when they're handing out their own books for free? <laughs> common sense. I could keep going, but seriously, the governing body and Brother Walls as the mouthpiece, they want to teach us about common sense. <laughs> I could spend another hour. I'm not going to. It's so absurd. And no one's thinking this. You go on the frequently asked questions section of this website and you see all the names of the governing body and you see the different committees and the dozens and dozens of governing body helpers. And they all get in rooms and nobody sits in that room and goes, I gotta tell you, I'm reading over this manuscript we're going to give Ralph Walls to say on video. Uh, some of this stuff doesn't make much sense, guys. And it totally obliterates other stuff we've said. Uh, it, it, there's not a one guy on these committees. Which goes to a whole other piece of this thought on thinking. But he continues by telling Jehovah's Witnesses that thinking ability is being put to the greatest test ever, that Satan is really deceptive. And then he says, quote, one of the helps that Jehovah's organization has provided is the publication Scriptures for Christian Living, end quote. And I'm done quoting this guy now. <laughs> I've mentioned it here ad nauseum. But if I'm trying to get to Jehovah's thinking, I have to question why. I'm reading a book published by a bunch of flesh and blood men just like me. You see, Brother Walls, I can read the Bible. And as I do, it tells me things like this at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. See if you too can comprehend what's said there. Jehovah's thinking, not my own. Quote, all scripture, the Bible, is inspired of God and beneficial for teaching, for reproving, for setting things straight, for disciplining in righteousness, so that the man of God may be fully competent, completely equipped for every good work. End quote. Brother Walls, there it is. Why do I need to know about your publication? I don't think I'm going to crack it open. I got this Bible thing here. It's not even a tablet. <laughs> I can turn its pages and it tells me it's all I need. I'm completely equipped. It doesn't mention your organization's publications and even Otter. It's a guarantee that the Bible itself is all any human being needs to be completely equipped and fully competent with Jehovah's thinking. We've already discussed his thinking. <laughs> So, Brother Walls, why does a Jehovah's Witness need to know what a bunch of guys just like them have to say about, well, anything? Why? Can you explain this, please? Why? I'm going to guess that you and your 11 friends in New York are the same guys that pur purposely rip the labeled off your mattresses at home. Are you one of those guys... <laughs> You know, mattress tags, they contain crucial information about the product, the manufacturing dates, the contents, the safety precautions, regulatory compliances. They offer essential insight into the mattress's origin. It ensures transparency and consumer protection. The tags serve as proof of purchase if you need to claim a warranty. But you don't need no mattress tag, Brother Walls. You have your own, right? <laughs> You're the guy who rips his mattress tag off. I always wondered what those tags were for. They're for guys like Brother Ralph Walls and the governing body. The Bible is supposed to complete people and give them Jehovah's thinking. He's pointing them to one of their publications. It never ends. A talk that is all about mind control, thought control, 
it comes on the heels of not looking at your memories, of not being nostalgic. In conclusion, the faithful and discreet slaves seem to be in the midst of an epic campaign these days. That's my sense. As you look at the spiritual food they're serving up, it all seems to have an underlying message. Obey the guys in New York, and that includes your memories, and that includes your private thoughts. Nothing creepy going on here, right? Nothing creepy at all. From an article on Psychiatric Times, February of 2022, co-written by Stephen Hassan, who we know is an expert in the field of cults, we find neutral doctors, however, telling us this, quote, to be independent thinkers, people require information from a wide variety of reputable sources. Cults indoctrinate members to distrust critics, former members, casualties, and any media that is negative. Some groups tell members to avoid newspapers, books, articles, TV, radio, and any academic science-based information. Some controllers keep believers so busy that they do not have time to think, check things out, or make outside relationships, end quote. I think I know some guys that do this. I think I know some. And well, just a reminder for those brave enough to still be here. The same guys in New York that claim to be guardians of Jehovah's thinking seem to have missed a few things, including this. One example. At Psalms 118 verses 8 and 9 of the New World Translation, we're told this, quote, It is better to take refuge in Jehovah than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in Jehovah than to trust in princes. End quote. Would you look at that? A warning for all of us thinkers out there in Jehovah's own words. Whether you trust in him or not is completely up to you. But even an independent thinker can see that Jehovah never wants anyone to trust anything from man-made royalty. I want to thank you for joining me this week. I hope you're thinking happy thoughts, but you don't need to share them. Wherever you may be, be well. 